Hey, lovely friends, students, and wild beasts! Today we're talking about the tragedy of the commons. You've heard the term before, right? And you might have some idea what it means. But if you're new to arguing with strangers about how the economy works, you might not. Let's mosey on over to Wikipedia. In economics and in an ecological context, the tragedy of the commons is a situation in which individual users who have open access to a resource unhampered by shared social structures, formal rules, etc. that regulate access and use, act independently according to their own self-interest, and contrary to the common good of all users, cause depletion of the resource through their uncoordinated action. The theory became widely known as the tragedy of the commons after an essay with this title was published in Science, written by Garrett Hardin in 1968. It became one of the most cited academic papers ever published, and also one of the most heavily criticized, particularly by anthropologists and historians. In 1991, faced with evidence of historical and existing commons, Hardin retracted his original thesis and wrote The Tragedy of the Unmanaged Commons. Hardin changed the name of his essay when he received criticism from historians saying that's not how it was actually, and from anthropologists saying that's not how it is actually. Possibly to reflect Hardin's essay, whoever wrote this Wikipedia article used industrial pollution as their prime example. Well, we'll come to that later. There is no doubt, in some contexts, a lack of clear rules or enforcement can mean nobody does what everyone should do. If you've ever had roommates, you might know what I mean. Maybe that's where Garrett Hardin got the idea from. Maybe he lived in an apartment with five other guys in their 20s and a sink full of dishes, you know? But is this behavior a consistent rule, a core trait of human nature? Or does it come from a situation engineered by the people in power and held in place with violence? If you've been on this channel before, you might already know the answer. The first thing you need to know about the commons is it's gone. Dead. Not everywhere in the world, but in most places. If your thought experiment doesn't take that into account, it can't be said to reflect anything in the real world. There is little or no common land or property people can use anywhere to become independent of the economic system. Second thing you need to know is the commons is gone because it's been destroyed. The history of the destruction of the commons, which we're taking a look at today, explains why we have jobs, why we have landlords, why we have to pay for everything, and why no one is independent. So, you know, it's pretty important. Most people only know the myths about the origins of the capitalist order that we live under. We don't ask why, we just look for jobs. The propaganda tells us modern economic arrangements, where a few people have everything and most people have nothing, are fair and justified by history. And then it never talks about the history. As a result, if you ask most people the origin of capitalism, or since they might not really know the word why some people are rich and others are poor, they might say something like, how long ago, in the Garden of Eden perhaps, some people just kind of worked really hard and saved money, like the ant, and the rest of the people just played all year, like the grasshopper. I read a book about this sort of thing once. Are you sure it was a book? Are you sure it wasn't nothing? Oh yeah. Actually, the opposite is true. The poorest people did all the work, the richest people sat back and got richer. So when the serfs finally emerged from feudalism, they had a whole new lord in the form of the boss. So let me sum up the actual origin of capitalism. Powerful people took every kind of resource you can name except oxygen and decided it was now theirs. What was unowned or commonly owned became privately owned, controlled by one or a few people not because they need it, but because everyone else needs it. 
and they would now have to pay for access. These became the owners of capital, or capitalists. Your family has farmed this paddock for centuries and rely on it for sustenance? Well, now you can rely on your boss for sustenance. Taking everything your family owned meant that you and your children would be forced into wage labor, forced to apply for jobs and follow orders and accept tiny fractions of the value you produce forever. Because other people own the stuff you need, and they'll only let you use it now if you pay. That's how they created what we call the labor market. Marx invented the term primitive accumulation of capital, or some phrase in German that was translated as primitive accumulation. It's also known as original expropriation, which might be more accurate, so that's what I'll call it. To staff their new enterprises, capitalists needed to create an entire class of workers that depended on people with money to survive. Workers would have to be so desperate to work to survive that they would do whatever exhausting, dangerous work was necessary. Capitalists needed to separate workers from the means of their subsistence, you know, the land. And the main way that they did that was through enclosure. Enclosure meant closing off the land to people who used to work it in common. Before enclosure, a lord probably owned the land in theory, but they let the local peasants work it as long as they handed over the surplus. Obviously, there was a lot more to feudalism than that, but that's not what we're talking about today. Before it was privately owned, a lot of land in Britain was commons. What was the commons like? Common fields and pastures kept alive a vigorous cooperative spirit in the community. Enclosures starved it. In Champagne country, people had to work together amicably to agree upon crop rotation, stints of common pasture, the upkeep and improvement of their grazings and meadows, the clearing of the ditches, the fencing of the fields. They toiled side by side in the fields, and they walked together from field to village, from farm to heath, morning, afternoon, and evening. They all depended on common resources for their fuel, for bedding, and fodder for their stock. And by pooling so many of the necessities of livelihood, they were disciplined from early youth to submit to the rules and customs of the community. After enclosure, when every man could fence his own piece of territory and warn his neighbors off, the discipline of sharing things fairly with one's neighbors was relaxed, and every household became an island unto itself. This was the great revolution in men's lives, greater than all the economic changes following enclosure. Yet few people living in this world bequeathed to us by the enclosing and improving farmer are capable of gauging the full significance of a way of life that is now lost. So life wasn't perfect, but at least they were living and working together for themselves. Expropriation of the commons meant taking the land and other resources people needed to survive and putting literal and legal fences around them. If you took away the peasants' land, they'd lose their ability to feed themselves independently and would now need to work for the new business owners who are offering wages. That was the point, to force people out of independence and into the factories, to work for the emerging capitalist class. Primitive accumulation cut through traditional lifeways like scissors. The first blade served to undermine the ability of people to provide for themselves. The other blade was a system of stern measures required to keep people from finding alternative survival strategies outside the system of wage labor. A host of oftentimes brutal laws designed to undermine whatever resistance people maintained against the demands of wage labor accompanied the dispossession of the peasants' rights, even before capitalism had become a significant economic force. By the way, I'm getting these quotes from this book, The Invention of Capitalism, and as always, there are links in the description. Not only does it tell the bitter tale of original expropriation in Britain, but what it's mostly about is how the economists and philosophers of the day, many of whom are still highly regarded, did everything they could to legitimize the violence. We regret to interrupt this fascinating lecture, but it's time to play Capitalist or Slaver!
I'll read out a quote, and you try to guess if it comes from a respected capitalist, statesperson, political economist, or philosopher who's merely speaking in favor of a capitalist economy, or a slave owner who wants more slaves. Are you ready? Number one. If a people have not acquired an habit of industry, the cheapness of all the necessaries of life encourages sloth. The best remedy is to raise the demand for all necessaries. Sloth should be punished by temporary servitude at least. Was that a quote from a slaver or an economist? It was by Francis Hutcheson, professor of moral philosophy, who taught Adam Smith, David Hume, and other Enlightenment thinkers. Number two. How about somebody suggesting employing children as young as four? For by these means we hope that the rising generation will be so habituated to constant employment that it would at length prove agreeable and entertaining to them. Sounds like someone who just wants slaves, right? But it was Sir William Temple, a statesman and diplomat. For a bonus point, John Locke, often seen as a philosopher of liberty, called for the commencement of work at the ripe age of three. Funny how we didn't learn about that when we read Locke at university. Number three. Who said the following, a capitalist or a slave driver? Poverty is that state and condition in society where the individual has no surplus labor in store, or, in other words, no property or means of subsistence but what is derived from the constant exercise of industry in the various occupations of life. Poverty is therefore a most necessary and indispensable ingredient in society, without which nations and communities could not exist in a state of civilization. It is the lot of man. It is the source of wealth, since without poverty there could be no labor, there could be no riches, no refinement, no comfort, and no benefit to those who may be possessed of wealth. Basically, us rich folks need to expand poverty to keep people coming back to work. Capitalist or slaver? It was Scottish magistrate and merchant Patrick Colhoun. By the way, did you read the sentences before it? After original accumulation, slavery and state violence would be unnecessary because the market itself would keep workers in a constant state of deprivation. Sound familiar? This was 200 years ago. The system was designed this way. And number four, what would you call someone who planned to get rich using forced inmate labor labor whose days would be planned down to the minute, who said, What hold can another manufacturer have upon his workmen equal to what my manufacturer would have on his? What other master is there that can reduce his workmen, if idle, to a situation next to starving, without suffering them to go elsewhere? What other master is there whose men can never get drunk unless he chooses that they should do so? and who, so far from being able to raise their wages by combination, are obliged to take whatever pittance he thinks it most his interest to allow. Well, we call him Jeremy Bentham, respected economist, father of utilitarianism, and philosopher of uh, freedom. Did you know his infamous panopticon design? You know, the prison that can monitor you all the time? was supposed to be part of a campaign of forced labor that Bentham would personally profit from? So many industry houses, so many crucibles in which dross of this kind, the poor, is converted into sterling. What better symbol of capitalism can you find than a man planning to profit from the misery of others, becoming known as an essential philosopher for everyone to read? So, how did you do? Did you get four out of four? Did you realize the heroes of liberty and the Enlightenment were only in favor of liberty for members of their class? Did you know how they advocated stealing everything from most people so they and their descendants would be forced to work all day forever?
But it's not surprising these public intellectuals would make things up to force people to work. They still do it today, and in fact have the same excuses, like people are getting lazy and work will cure that. What they called for two, three, four hundred years ago was the complete reconstruction of society, turning everyone into wage laborers by force. To do so, they had to deprive all future workers of the means of subsistence, like the little bit of land they could cultivate and graze on. The new capitalist state also strengthened the game laws to deal out horrific punishments, including execution for poaching and hunting. John Bellers, famed Quaker philanthropist, remarked, Our forests and great commons make the poor that are upon them too much like the Indians? Being a hindrance to industry and our nurseries of idleness and insolence. Blackstone on the same page talks about idleness. Elsewhere, misspending their time, slovenly gluttony and drunkenness. It's interesting how many public intellectuals then and now claim the real problem with the poor is they just don't work hard enough. Huge numbers of peasants had to begin looking for paid work in factories, often in cities. For each resource that got fenced off, they had to work more. The more they worked, the less time they had to do anything else. By the way, if you're asking, but why didn't anyone resist these changes, they did. But we're not going into it in this video, which is long enough already. This video is part two of a series, so stick around. Notwithstanding the backlash, now owners or capitalists had a whole class of people they could draw on to make stuff for them. Being desperate for money, workers were in constant competition with all other workers who might be able to take their place. On the commons, cooperation was the norm. I mean, it would have to be to live there sustainably. There are people around the world who've lived cooperatively as stewards of the land for thousands of years, but original expropriation forced them off their land and into whatever jobs they could get. After a couple of centuries of capitalism, the world is facing multiple ecological crises. This channel's old friend Prageru once tweeted, End climate change seems to always translate to end capitalism. Oh yeah? Well, why do you think that might be? Laborers made just enough to survive and created huge amounts of wealth for the people they worked for. Over the next few generations, the state would start to serve this new class of rich people, the ones who made their money from industry rather than just from being aristocrats, and upended the entire feudal social order and replaced it with capitalism. Economists and people getting rich called for state intervention into every town and industry to make it impossible for small producers to remain independent and produce for themselves. These transformations led directly to the distinct features of capitalism we're familiar with today. Competition, reinvesting surpluses, improving productivity, maximizing profit by any means necessary. Once Britain had established a market-based economy at home, it began exporting the model abroad. That's why I focus on Britain in this video. That's where capitalism as we know it was born. Other parts of feudal Europe developed their own versions of capitalism, but it was Britain's model that spread to the rest of the world. Let's remember that when all this legal robbery was going on domestically, abroad Britain was colonizing half the planet. Britain was the hegemon, the strongest power in the international system, and like many hegemons in history, it transplanted its domestic model of governance on to the rest of the world for its own interests, not just in the heyday of empire, but even as it was dying. Along with original expropriation went white supremacist and patriarchal beliefs that justified conquest and slavery. The mix of local conditions gave 
the expropriation a different character in each place. So in the Americas, for example, they had all these enslaved African people with white overseers, so capitalists there have always invoked white supremacy to defend their interests. Which is why even today, places like the US and Brazil have some of the highest prison populations, which are disproportionately black and are often forced to work. Hitler made it clear the Western European colonial model would inspire his policies, and the British concentration camps were just the thing for his enemies. But it's only Hitler we condemn for it. We don't care so much about the people all around the rest of the world who were enslaved and killed to create the other empires. We'll watch every World War II documentary and imagine it was all unprecedented and Hitler just came up with this stuff out of nowhere. When the empires had made it clear causing unimaginable suffering to millions is fine as long as you don't do it in Europe after World War I. But expropriation and slavery on a massive scale to build your empire? It's normal. And even though World War II helped put a nail in the coffin of most empires, obviously the, the US and Russian empires accepted, the war did nothing to shift the systems the empires had put in place. Resources were still in the hands of former imperial powers, and the ones that weren't got privatized in the 1970s and 80s. The structure of national economies is still focused on exporting these resources to former colonial powers. The local elites get rich, so it's in their interest. If they don't comply with mandates from, you know, the US government and a bunch of big banks, they get toppled in a coup. So don't tell me imperialism is over. It just has local spokespeople now. Let's revisit the so-called tragedy of the commons. It seems like all the examples people bring up of the tragedy of the commons are situations existing because of capitalism. Take land and water use. The commons, remember, was when no one owned the land and resources were shared. And the tragedy was supposedly that no one would treat nature sustainably and resources would get depleted. But there is no more common land. All land is the monopoly of the state. And most of it gets leased out to corporations. If people are, say, using too much water, it's not the commons they're taking from. They've long been alienated from the commons and rely on a state monopoly for water. Indigenous people around the world have gathered water sustainably, but under capitalism. If a corporation friendly with the current government wants to poison your water supply or, say, pollute the air, it might. As a result of this centralized control Garrett Hardin was in favor of, scientists recently recommended avoiding eating any freshwater fish caught anywhere in the U.S. because they're so full of toxins. Who do you think dumped those toxins? Was it you and your neighbors taking advantage of a commonly owned, poorly managed river? Or was it corporations who didn't feel like paying to clean up their messes. States and corporations are both forms of centralized control over resources. While they exist, it's meaningless to talk about the tragedy of the commons. We're dealing with the much bigger problem of the privatization of the commons. Hey, you still like fish? Well, we're running out. Tens of billions of subsidies to fishing industries have enabled bigger ships to go farther, fish for longer, and bring back more. Fish stocks are collapsing worldwide not because the ocean is commons, but because capitalism provides no incentives for sustainability. The incentives are to privatize the food supply and take as much as you can in the short term. So that's where we are today, after everything has been stolen from us. In a time when we condemn the petty thieves to years of prison and years more of prejudice, but the big thieves have everything in the world they could want. Do with this information as you see fit.